Happy Sabbath. We're going to be turning to uh, uh, the book of Samuel, first, first Samuel. And I'm going to be going to uh, chapter six, uh, 16. And in verse... Seven. This is where Samuel, um, Saul, uh, had been uh, had been uh, skipped over as king, uh, or or surpassed or whatever. Uh, he wasn't obeying God, and now God was going to raise up for Israel another king for, uh, from the house of Jesse. So Samuel here in verse uh, seven. Uh, sorry, we'll go back to verse six to give it more uh, co uh, context. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab. Eliab was uh, was the son of Jesse, and he thought to himself, "Surely the Lord's, the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord." But the Lord said to Samuel, "So the Lord was speaking with Samuel while he was still standing in the house." So Samuel heard this voice. Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Right? And we know that when Jesus Christ came, that he looked like an average man, and that he wasn't, uh, he wasn't uh, a very handsome, dashing man. He was just an average-looking man. And uh, that was important. He had no advantage. He didn't have any charisma you know, that would cause us to gravitate towards him. So, and that's just the way God works. He works with the simple things, with things that can't self-glorify. And David definitely was one of them, being the youngest and being out, not even considered to be brought before Samuel. So, God looks at the inside, not the outside. In Jeremiah uh, 17, that's made even more clear. It, it absolutely spells it out. But this inner voice that Samuel heard, when you have the Holy Spirit, which Samuel most certainly did, and we're going to get into that a little later, that you can't uh, you can't please God without that Spirit, and you can't uh, you can't meet His requirements without that Spirit. So we also have that kind of voice in us. It's not audible, but we know that it is uh, abstract from us because it guides us and directs us, and it works with uh, some kind of voice inside uh, that tells us what we're doing wrong. Anyway, Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 10, he makes it very, very clear. I, the Lord, search the heart, and I examine the mind to reward a man or a woman according to his or her conduct, according to what his or her deeds deserve. So there you go. It's by what we do. And you know that a lot of what motivates us to do certain things you know, speaks to where our heart is at, to where our priorities are. So, of course, e evil people are going to have the wrong kind of intent, and that's going to be that's going to be very visible. We see that here when we were reading in, in Matthew seven, right? When you when you see that in, in uh, what we've just read in Samuel and in Jeremiah, keeping that in mind, I wrote down here from verse fifteen. Right of uh, Matthew chapter 7, we were here. Now this was Christ. And I was pointing out how very strange it was for him to actually caution people, or the, cr the crowds at large, about false prophets. When they were still questioning who he was. They knew that he couldn't have done the miracles that he was doing unless God was with them. They knew that, right? Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ferocious wolves. So he's describing uh, a class of people that have a certain nature in them. Because a certain spirit is guiding them. Right? And they're ferocious. They're predatorial. Right? Inwardly, they are ferocious wolves. And they're purposefully disguising themselves. Why is that? Why are they doing that? Why are they disguising themselves? You know, if you stand for what you stand for, if you believe what you believe, 
why don't you have to disguise yourself? Well, because we're told that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So this is this deception is done on purpose. And it's done very effectively. That's why Christ is telling you in his own mouth, watch out. So if Jesus Christ is telling you to watch out, how it more intently should you watch? By their fruit you will recognize them. So now he's giving you certain features and factors that will enable you to distinguish a, a false prophet who's a ferocious wolf who wants to prey upon you. That's what a wolf is. It's a predator. And when he describes him as a ferocious wolf, it can mean nothing good for those that they prey on. They become consumed. Right? But he said, by their fruits you will recognize them. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of our God. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. Do, and then he goes on to, to help you map this out of your mind so that you can be completely clear. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? And of course the crowd says to themselves, well, of course not. Or figs from thistles? And then he says, likewise, every good tree, every good person will bear the fruit of their conduct. The fruit of that conduct and the fruit of their intent will be clearly seen. And that's why I've said weeks and weeks and weeks ago and, and for weeks and weeks that show me your love before you show me your authority. Don't walk in and tell me you're a minister or a teacher or some kind of leader. I want to see your love first. I want to see your servitude first. Right? And that's why we here at God Seekers, you know, we wash each other's feet. There's no leaders per se. There's brothers and sisters. This is a sideways uh, uh, system or a bottom-up system, a foot washing system, a system that's patterned after the servitude of our Lord and Master, of our God. There's no question about that. But this hierarchical system, we are against. And that hierarchical system is going to be torn down. That body of Christ is going to come together. And that body is going to function. And they're going to implement those very same things that Jesus Christ asked us to implement. Brotherly love. Examining our hearts on a daily basis. Bringing our talents to bear so that we don't, uh, we're not idle. We're productive. We're interactive. We fellowship as after the pattern of the first century church. And if they were fellowshipping on a daily basis, if they were connected spiritually one with another and couldn't be without one another and were driven to do so, how much more do you think that that is going to occur in the season, in the time of the returning Christ? That's going to be very powerful stuff. And my brothers and I have talked about this. We know that this season is upon us. We know that this is coming. Just by the way that we came together. Just by the way that we came together. We came together because Christ brought us together. Because we yielded to his command. To learn to love one another. We didn't really know each other. And those new brothers that will be at it, we really won't know you either. But we will know you quick enough and soon enough by the spirit that is inside of you. And by the fruit that that spirit produces. Because it is akin and could join one to another with those of like mind who produce the same fruit. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. So us good trees are going to meet each other. And when we come together, we're going to build a house. We're going to have a harvest. There's going to be a crop. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. And God judges the inside of a man or a woman and looks and he sees right through them and he sees and evaluates them. Do you have a good heart or do you have a bad heart? Do you have a heart that is willing to be healed or do you have a heart that is interrupted, that is self-serving and that is not charitable? So a good tree, a good tree like we read last week or a week, a week or so ago, it cannot bear bad fruit, right? It cannot bear bad fruit. Because we read in 1 John 3, right? 1 John 3 verse 9, that God's seed dwells in you. 
That's why you can't do anything that's wrong. You will not, you will not habitat. You will not share that same portion in your nature over and over again. You won't uh, let it repeat. You will move on from it. You will overcome it. That's why Christ said very clearly, you can't serve two masters. You cannot be stagnant. You cannot be lukewarm. Number one, he won't allow it. And number two, it's no way to exist. And that should have startled people when they were reading about the Laodicean church. When Christ, their God, said to them, I wish that you were either one or the other. I wish that you were either hot or cold. Wow. He's saying, I wish that you either walked away from what your belief system is, or that you were fervent and hot for it. You know what I'm saying? So. Is there trouble over there? Be good boy. Be good. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. He knows. But no, like, and, and that's a good example right there. Like, we're like children to our God. And sometimes we do things that are wrong. Sometimes we act because we're spoiled or because we want our own way. And God has to move in and correct us. And we're told by Scripture that He does so to those that He loves. And we know that that is also a sign that He loves us because He corrects us like a parent or a grandparent. So anyway, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and it's thrown into the fire. So he says again, one more time, and this is definitely pertinent, by their fruit you will recognize them. Again, he's bringing you to examine anyone that you meet, to examine him next to the scripture, and to examine him next to the spirit that dwells inside of you, that you have to recognize you know your brother when you when you when you meet them. You know your brother, just as you know your master's voice, because your brother is also guided by the same things, by that master's voice, and by those things that live in him, that have been planted in him. So he said, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, and inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. And I have written down here that the actions speak the heart and the mind. You don't need to talk to somebody over and over to get inside their head. You just have to watch what they do. That tells you what their priorities are. And then we know when we've just read from Scripture that God searches the heart very deeply and He knows who is legitimate and who isn't. Now the question you have to ask is where are your feet standing in this moment? What are your hands doing? What is your mouth saying? And this goes for everybody. We have to self-correct. I have to ask myself, what is your mouth saying? Would God be pleased at hearing what you're saying? Would God be pleased, you know, with what your hands are doing or what your intent is here? And is this corrective and constant corrective action that keeps us from sinning and that perfects us and helps us to overcome? Real fruit can only grow when the Lord has planted his seed or his spirit. And I'll just turn really quickly here to First John. You don't have to turn there. I can just read it out. So we've, we've read it already. First John 3, verse 9. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. Right? And then he goes on to distinguish even further the fruit of what these words are producing, the fruit of what these words are, are describing. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. John was very descriptive here, very, uh, very decisive. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. And last week or a week before, I was correlating that those two are joined together. Anyone who doesn't do what is right is just as equal as anyone who doesn't love his brother. Are you kidding me? It's right there. I'm not, this isn't up to interpretation. It's very simple words. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God. Very simple. A 10 year old child can tell me what that means. Nor is anyone who does not love his brother. Like, it's very plain. And, 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 and we're on this journey. Uh, to try and find out what this exactly means and where this leads. 
and it's uh, we're heading that way on our knees. We're trying. So real fruit can only grow when the Lord has planted His seed. Right? You can't keep going on sinning because the seed has been planted in you. The Holy Spirit's been planted in you. Right? And it's uh, been planted in a man's heart, the Spirit. And then I have written down here, wheat for his barn, fruit from his vine, bricks and stones for his house. Because he's building it. We're not building it. We're, we are complying. This is his master plan. We're a part of it, absolutely. But it's his master plan. I'm turning to Hebrews chapter 11. Oh, that's good. Hebrews chapter 11. And this is, this is really, really uh, well known. Right? But is it? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, now faith okay, is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And that sounds confusing, but it's really not. It's being sure of what we hope for. And the reason why we hope for it is because we have His Spirit or because we have enough understanding that allows us to always hope for what is good and not bad. So now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see, and that requires the Spirit. This is what the ancients were commended for. So now, when you're reading this, your ears should prick up, and you should be saying, well, well what were they commended for? Who are these ancients? By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, the command from his mouth, right? So that what is seen was not made without, with, uh, made, made out of what was visible. And John, I'll read it for you real quick, just while it strikes my mind at this moment, right? Here, Gospel of John, real quick. He's saying, in the beginning was the Word. The Word, right? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So now we have two personages, distinct one from another. He was with God in the beginning. The beginning of what? Well, the beginning of the creation of our habitat, of the universe, and of this, of this, uh, of this uh, habitat that we live in, this planet. Through him all things were made. And this signature of things that have been made are a signature of his character, his plan, and his will for us. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. What does that mean? In him was life. So this was a portion that he could extend to a being. To be able to create a being that would live forever, or to be able to create beings that were physical, that were comparatively made of clay, as we would understand clay. And they were temporal, you know, and uh, abiotic, uh, uh, or sorry, biotic beings. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Right? That's how it's uh, described here in First John. And then back to uh, Hebrews 11, verse 3. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. And we know from reading 1 John that nothing that has been made has been made without it. This word was distinct from God, but was with God. So that what is seen was not made out of, uh, out of what was visible. Right? Now here we go. By faith, Abel... Now we know who one of the ancients were. Offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. Right? When we go to 1 John, chapter 3, where we were, and we go to verse 11, right? John uses this same person to highlight something that should be in us and that we should be aware of. So in 1 John 
chapter 3, verse 11, it says, This is the message that you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. Right? John was just finished talking about this is how we know who children of God are and who the children of the devil are. He's using Abel as an example of the ch children of God. And he's using Cain as an example of who carries the nature and who belongs to the devil. And we have those same people through the course of history. We have those same people that we rub shoulders with today. Some of them belong to the devil. Some of them belong to God. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? What are the factors surrounding him, the, uh, Cain murdering his brother? Because his own actions were evil, and his brothers were righteous. And those two paths crossed. They crossed over one another. Abel was doing his righteous acts. He was making his own independent decisions. He was overcoming his carnal nature. Cain was doing evil. And when the two of them crossed paths, and one, the righteous man's offering was accepted, and the one who was doing wicked things, it wasn't bringing the best. When he was doing uh, wicked things, their paths crossed at that point. And what happened when their paths crossed was Cain murdered his brother. But we could say, still see this same murderous spirit. And I'll prove that as we go on today here. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. But why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. There is a war going on. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. Right? We know that we have passed from death to life and we know who the life is. We just read it in the Gospel of John. That he was the life, the life of the world. In him was life. And he was the light of the world. So we know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Wow. Here's another incredibly powerful hinge point to our salvation. We know, and this is from John's words, we know that we have passed from death to life. In other words, we know that there is more for us after we die, because it's given to every man to die once, every man or every woman. But we know that there's a hope beyond that death for us, right? If we love our brothers, period. Anyone who does not love remains in death with no hope. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer like Cain. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him, not for him. He has no eternal life in him. There are no room for my words in you. And these are the words of one who is called the life and the light. Wow. So that says so much in such a little uh, uh, space. It's just incredible. So, when God spoke well, back to Hebrews 11, and verse, uh, verse 4. <clears throat> so by faith, Abel was commended as a righteous man because he did what is right. When God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith he still speaks even though he is dead. What does that mean? By faith, Abel still speaks even though the guy's dead. What does that mean? Let me tell you what it means. Let me try to tell you. By faith, Abel speaks even though he is dead. Well, you have to go back to when this happened. And in Genesis chapter 4, right, okay, and in verse 10, it says, The Lord said to Cain, What have you done? Listen, your brother's, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. What does that mean? Now you are under a curse, and you are driven from the ground, which opened its mouth 
to receive your brother's blood from your hand. In other words, when you strike down anyone, there is a record and there is a judgment. But when you strike down a righteous man, and that's why Christ turned to them and said, can any one of you accuse me of sin? You know that I'm not guilty of anything. You can't bring a charge against me, and yet you want to kill me. Why? Because I told you the truth? Why do you want to kill me? What's that a sign of? Why don't you understand what I'm telling you? What's that a sign of? Your brother's blood right, cries out to me from the ground, and he tells Cain to listen. That's incredible. So there's something there, spiritually churning. Even though there's been a physical death and blood has been spilt, something very powerful is turning and turning. These are things that only God can hear. But he still asked Cain to listen. He was trying to get him to understand the gravity of what he did. And John, who has read the same passages that we're reading, John is saying that he belonged to the devil. That's why he murdered a righteous man. Because that's what the evil side does. That's what that spirit does. It murders those who are followers. And then just before that, John said, don't be surprised that the world hates you. In other words, wake up. Be enlightened. Learn what I'm telling you. Don't be surprised that the world hates you. Now that you know the map of what's going on here. Isaiah chapter 26, it goes on to describe this. I asked you what it meant, that by faith he still speaks, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. What does that mean? Well, now we understand that Abel's blood cried out to God. It cried out for judgment, for justice, because he was righteous, and he didn't deserve this death. He was clearly murdered, just like they murdered Christ, just like they murdered all the other prophets. Isaiah 26 and verse 21. See the Lord is coming out of his dwelling. Okay. To punish the people of the earth for their sins. The earth will disclose the blood shed upon her. She will conceal her slain no longer. In other words, there will be a reckoning. There will be an accounting. And Christ's own words, right, in Matthew 23, describe more of that. There's a story here. We're reading a storyline. There's a storyline here. And we'll go to Matthew 23. We're reading a story, people. And the patterns and the collection of that story are all over the Bible. And you can see it right now, Matthew 23. We'll start in verse uh, 29. We read this as well. And there's a reason why we read it, because now it's been planted in your memory. Verse 29 of Matthew 23 says, and these are words of Jesus Christ, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build tombs for the prophets, and you decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say to yourselves, Oh, if only we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would have not taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So even that is, is, is condemning. We wouldn't have taken part with them, our forefathers, right, in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. There's something there in that. That's very simple to understand. And then Jesus said, So you testify against yourselves that you are indeed the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. And like those descendants, you have the same spirit. Fill up the measure, then, the measure of the sin of your forefathers. If you understand what they did, and you are the same. Fill up the measure, then, you snakes, you brood of vipers, you wolves in sheep's clothing. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and wise men, and teachers. This is in the future. He's sending them. Some of them you will kill 
and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues, and you will pursue them and chase them down from town to town. Verse 33. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Now he's speaking to this spirit that dwells in these people just as much as it dwelled in their ancestors before them. And just like their ancestors before them, these men in Christ's day are going to finish him. And some of them are going to finish his, his apostles and his disciples. And this same spirit that's going to live in the descendants of these ones are going to also finish the ones that he sent ahead, especially in the day and in the season and in the hour of his coming. They will kill them again. So says Christ. Yeah. Therefore I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and others you will flog in their synagogues, and you will pursue them. In other words, you will be adversarial to them, whoever I said. You'll murder them, you'll beat them, you'll chase them down. Wow. Verse 36. <clears throat> I tell you the truth. All of this will come upon this, this generation. Right? Now we know that the generation that was standing in Christ's day, that that wasn't the generation. As far as I'm concerned. And I could be wrong. I always could be wrong. That's why we need to check the scriptures. And fact check. And, and check what I'm saying to be uh, to be so. We have to do that. Because we correct one another. We learn to love one another. And we should be accepting correction from one another. If your brother can show you something, you know, you should listen to him. Because he's been given to you to help you develop. What he has, you do not have. And what you have, he does not have. But what you have together is life. Because you walk in love. So. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, and from the blood of righteous Abel to Zechariah. This is a, an, an indictment against a spirit that is dwelling in men who appease this spirit and serve this spirit because this spirit is their master. They are the children of the devil. Simply put. John chapter 21. Right? Again. Speaks even though he is dead. Don't forget what we read in Hebrews 11. And by faith, Abel still speaks. Even though he is dead, he still speaks. And I asked you what that meant. In John chapter 21, and verse 18, is a very curious thing. Right? This Jesus has been resurrected. He's come and he's met with his disciples again. And now he is speaking to Peter. After Peter had disowned him. And he told Peter, and he asked him, do you love me? And he asked him three times. And Peter was hurt about that. So Jesus said to Peter for the third time, feed my sheep. This is what I want you to do, Peter. If you love me, you will feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, Peter, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted to go. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands. And someone else will dress you. And they will lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, and caught his attention, and he said to him, follow me. Follow me. So Peter would glorify God by the kind of death that he was going to die. And that just, I don't understand that. But this it belongs in the realm of God's privilege, of his understanding, of his glory. 
And if he's saying that this man's death is going to glorify God and give glory to God by that death, then that's so. But what I'm trying to tell you is that these kind of things have not done their cycle. They're not completed yet. They're not finished. So, Jesus Christ, with his own words, indicated to Peter that he would glorify God by the kind of death that he was going to experience. And there are some speculation as to what kind of death he died. Christ made it very, very uh, poignant when he said to him, someone will dress you and it will take you by the hand to a place where you do not want it. It would take him when he's a very old man to die. Hebrews chapter 12, just ahead of where we're principally reading. And I've got written down here verse 24. And it says, again, speaking of, uh, of Abel, and we'll back it up to verse uh, 23. This is some very powerful stuff. To the, to the church of the firstborn. Okay. We know that Christ is the firstborn of many brothers. To the church of the firstborn. To the church of Christ. Whose names are written in heaven. Who he foreknew. Who he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. You have come to God. The judge of all men. To the spirits of righteous men made, made perfect. What does that mean? God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. Wow. That is definitely something that you need to consider. To Jesus, the firstborn, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood Right? Now he's speaking in a covenantal or in a sacrificial language that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What does that mean? Abel was righteous and he was murdered by his brother who did evil, who had that spirit, who served that master. But Jesus Christ came, and like John said, John the Baptist, he came from above and he spoke as one who heard things personally from his own father. We are from the earth. But he was the firstborn. And he was resurrected. And he said to them, Because I go, I will send you the helper. And he will guide you and show you of all things. And he will remind you of what I said. And he will be with you forever. Wow. Verse 25. Again, this is, this is amazing stuff. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks, him who has spoken to your ear, him who has planted the seeds through your ear that have affected your heart, him who has planted his seed in you, which is the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit, which reminds you of his words and shows you into all things. Him who speaks. Remember what we read. Again, this is going back to what we read. And there was a reason why we read it, so that it would live in you. And I didn't know that until most recently. I just read it, and it lived in me. And when I read these scriptures, these words came back. And it's nothing to marvel at. It is the action of the Holy Spirit. And that happens in all of us. That's the point. It's supposed to. Deuteronomy chapter 18, and verse 19, it says, right? Don't forget what we just read here in Hebrews, okay? See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. Okay. And we read other scriptures in weeks, in weeks past. Embrace the Son. Accept the Son. Kiss the Son. Lest the Father be angry. So let's, we've read this as well right here. Verse 19. Right. Actually we'll back it up to verse 18. So it gives us some, some context. I will raise up for them a prophet like you. And we know that this was the first time, for the most part, that there was a direct prophecy of the Messiah. Besides when Adam and Eve were being dealt with. And the woman was told that he would bruise her heel and she would crush 
her seed would crush his head. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, right? From among their brothers, a prophet that would liberate and emancipate you from bondage, a prophet like you. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell you them everything that I command him. Now here's what I wanted you to focus on, verse 19. If anyone does not listen to my words, that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself personally will call him to account. That's some powerful stuff. And when we read the scriptures that it is a fearful and dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Wow. So he is attentive. And when these words come and they are breathed on you and they live inside of you, you need to pay attention. And that's what we're reading here in verse 25. The author of Hebrews is speaking something spiritual to you. And he's calling you to recollect the power of the words that were spoken right from the beginning in Deuteronomy. The same words that interacted with the same spirit that was in him, that is interacting with the same spirit that is in you. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks to your innermost parts. If they did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, face to face like he did, how much less will we escape if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven and we are aware of it and we know it. That's why Christ said, he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. How can something that was salty and loses its saltiness be good for anything? <clears throat> How can a tree that bears no fruit be continued to allow to consume? It can. It can. It's got to go. Revelation 17 I have written down here. Revelation 17. Verse 6. Again. Don't forget what Christ said in Matthew 23, that this blood guilt was going to rest on their heads. Revelation chapter 17, verse 6. I saw the woman who was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore the testimony of Jesus. Who are those people? If we are Christ's, and the Spirit dwells in us, then that Spirit calls on us to overcome and to be patterned after Christ. And if we are patterned after Christ, then He has conferred a kingdom on us, just as His Father conferred a kingdom on Him. And if we are the firstborn, first, if He is the firstborn, and we are brothers to that firstborn, then we carry a testimony in our actions. We carry a testimony in our heart. We carry a testimony in our mouth, on our lips. And we'll read that scripture that confirms that. And as much as you don't believe that, or you'll find it hard to believe, what, little old me? I carry the testimony of Jesus Christ? Yeah, you do. That's the point. <laughs> if his spirit dwells in you, then you carry a testimony. I saw the woman who was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of those who bore, carried, wore like a garment the testimony of Jesus because there were caused to be a pattern after him because God foreknew them. He foreknew them and he calls them his children. Back up here in Revelation 6. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 6. It says, verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, in verse 9 of chapter 6, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God. Right? Remember what we read in Isaiah about their bodies being, the earth is going to cough them up. The, the bodies are going to be exposed. And the blood is going to be known. 
And Christ warned them and said, what you whisper in the ear will be shouted from the rooftops. What you've done in secret will be known. This speaks of this time. I saw under the altar, under the altar, the altar where they worship, just like the angel was told to count the worshipers at the altar. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God, the testimony of God, and the testimony that they had maintained. Why does it say that word? The testimony that they had maintained, they had worked out. Wow. They called out in a loud voice. Remember we asked the question, how does Abel's, Abel's blood still speak? How does his faith still speak long after he's dead? They called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. And then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants, until the number, there's a number here, of their fellow servants, their servants, like their master, and brothers who love each other, and the graduacy of their salvation is a hinge point to that love, who were to be killed, who were to be killed, who were designated to be killed, just as much as with confidence that Christ could turn to Peter and tell him, long before that death ever met him, Peter, when you were young, you dressed yourself. But when you're old, someone else is going to dress you. And someone else is going to take your hand and lead you to a place where you do not want to go. He told them that years before he would die. Until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. There was a completion. There was a number. They were servants and brothers. They didn't have titles. They were servants and brothers. Just as Christ told them, just as we've read in weeks past. Wow, that's incredible. That's incredible stuff. <clears throat> so there's a number. We carry his testimony. We have a destiny to fulfill. A part of carrying that testimony, part of being conformed to the pattern of Christ, is being molded into a servant. When we're not naturally like that. Part of being molded into a pattern of Christ could be the possibility that we would also be hated and also be murdered like our master. Martyred. Just like he told Peter he would be. Wow. That's, that's incredible stuff. So back to Hebrews, chapter 11. Thanks for being patient. We're almost done here. Yeah, we've got about 10 more minutes and our hour is up. Um, so yeah, even though he is dead, by faith he still speaks. And it is that faith that is causing his preservation. And we just read this. We just read this. You need to reread over it. Right? By faith, chapter 11, verse 5, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. Okay? Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. What does that mean? Well, when we go to 1 Corinthians, verse 15, it tells, you, it tells you a mystery. Paul is revealing a mystery. And this is the scripture that has been said over and over and over again. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I have here to start in verse 51. We'll go back to verse 50 to give it more, like I said, more, more uh, context. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And we read this when Christ was talking to Nicodemus. That which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. 
right? Now we get to the meat and potatoes of what I was trying to describe. Listen. That's what he says. Listen. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound, and the dread dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable, which is us, physical human beings, must clothe itself with imperishability or imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Don't forget who Paul was talking to. He said in verse 50, I declare to you brothers. These were people who had understanding. But he wanted to show them and he said, I tell you a mystery. This was something that they didn't quite understand. There was something connected to it that was deeper. Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. And that is possible when you line it up with scripture. Paul was telling them a mystery. I tell you a mystery, brothers. We shall not all sleep. Wow. So, and we know Paul had seen things that no other man had seen. He had an experience that most men never have. So as well as John, John also had that experience. And as well as Ezekiel, Ezekiel seen things as well. So there was a lot of them that seen some stuff that was very, uh, very different. Quiet, Shh, quiet. Yeah, wait, it's a few more minutes, okay? And then we'll be done. Five more minutes, then we're finished. So he declares to them a mystery. And these are people that have understood, right? He was revealing something to his brothers. And his brothers had a full understanding. What was he revealing? There's more there, for sure. There's more all over the place. But it, uh, it, has, to be, uh, it has to be revealed. And it's up to Christ to reveal that. For before he was taken, he was commended, right? Back to Hebrews. Before Enoch was taken... He was commended, um, sorry, uh, by faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, right, he was commended as one who pleased God, right? And when I read that, I read in Jude, <clears throat> Quiet for a few more minutes. A couple more minutes, yeah. I read in Jude uh, 14. Jude only has one chapter, I guess you could call it, but it's very, very insightful. Jude 14 says this Enoch the seventh from Adam. Enoch the seventh from Adam. Wow. Prophesied about these men. He, what did he prophesy? See the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone. Enoch had a vision of the Messiah. Long before Moses ever walked the earth, long before Moses ever turned around and said that God would raise up for them a prophet from among their own people, from among his own brothers, a prophet that they had to listen to. That's really insightful. This is a messianic uh, uh, prophecy here that Enoch was known to speak. And this is what Enoch said. He was the seventh one that had the Holy Spirit and that was called of God since Adam. The seventh one with full understanding. And this is what Enoch's testimony was. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone. And to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts that they have done in the ungodly way and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Wow. And don't forget, Enoch was in a world that was fast turning very evil. And it finally culminated and got to a point where God was not only hurt by it, 
His heart was hurt by it. And he regretted that he even made man. Because eventually only Noah was left alive. That was righteous. Only him. One man. Out of a whole planet full of people. Well, this was Enoch's testimony. While this planet, while these people were turning more and more evil, until God's judgment came upon them, and he said, I will, my spirit will not contend with man. What does that mean? My spirit will not put up with man. That's what it says. That's what it says. My spirit. Genesis chapter 6, in closing. We'll get into this a little more next week. Okay. Right here, Genesis chapter 6. And we'll start uh, in verse 1. That's fine. So then men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them. And the sons of God, men who had understanding, right, saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them that they chose. They chose them by their beauty. They didn't choose them by their belief system. And that's how this earth became more corrupted. Because they didn't follow and choose their mates properly. They chose them on their looks only. And that was a big mistake. And then he says right here something very profound. Then the Lord said, he made this statement. And don't forget who's speaking. It is the God who said, let there be light. My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal, thank goodness, for his days will be 120 years. And then we can just read here in closing really quick here. That's time. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of his thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, that he even started this plan. And don't forget, this is the heart of the Almighty who had a plan from beginning to end. And he was grieved at this particular portion in this plan, that it had come to this point so quickly. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. His heart was filled with pain. Now we know more about our God. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground, and the birds in the air, again, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And while this earth was turning into such a state where their hearts we're coming up with evil things all the time, so much so, and at a capacity or a level where it grieved God and his heart was filled with pain. That's what the scripture says. Enoch and those, Enoch who was the seventh from Adam, with the spirit, with understanding, the seventh speaker, the seventh one who was telling them their sins, who was showing them their sins, because the spirit was living in Enoch, and Enoch could not control what was coming out of his mouth. He was compelled by the selection of the Almighty, by what God had planted inside of him, to show the people their sins. And he did. And Jude quotes him. But Enoch was already talking about the Messiah coming to judge the world. Wow, that's quite a ways before Christ even came the first time, never mind the second time. Until next week, we'll get into some more of this. These heirs of righteousness. Thank you. Yeah.